to you live from Larry's Inner Circle in Lake Wiley, South Carolina. The Goins Group is proud to present today's episode of Invest in Yourself. And it's brought to you by the guy who's going to teach you about the mistakes investors make and how you might possibly avoid them. Here's your host, Larry Goins. This is not hilarious oh, about Todd. That's that's awesome. Awesome. He's, he's a good guy. <laughs> that's good. That's good. Like I see Wendy back there in the background. What's up? Hey. hey, everybody out there in internet land. What's happening? I'm here with Paul Olson, the man, the legend, the myth. He is our relational technologist. Welcome to Invest in Yourself. And um, uh, this is the show that we do. Right now, we're doing it once a month. And it's live right here from in my office in our conference room where we do our meetings and our uh, inner circle events and that sort of thing. We've taken all the phones off here because in inner circle, everybody gets on the phone. They're hammering out deals and making offers and buying properties. But uh, to do this show, we have to adjust things a little bit. But uh, I want you to remember this show, we're going to give you as much as we can in this kind of environment. This in no way is any kind of a substitute for a formal education or for home study courses, whether it's mine or anybody else's or reading books or, you know, watching other videos and trainings and getting yourself a mentor, whether it's me or anybody else. So, uh, but we do want to provide you with as much information and content as we can. And today we're going to talk about mistakes. Uh, and the reason I've got Paul up here is quite frankly because I've never really made any mistakes. So I had to get <laughs> of course, you know, the guy brings some mistakes to the table, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> man, I got to tell you, I've made so many mistakes in real estate. <laughs> you just would not believe. In fact, it reminds me uh, the first kind of things that were coming to mind when Todd came up with this whole theme for this of mistakes. You know, it's really, really important, guys, that you realize real estate investing is not all, you know, cash and cash flow and having fun and making money and depositing checks. You know, I've lost money on a lot of deals. The most money I ever lost on a deal was $75,000. You know, and I say it really fast because it hurts when you say $75,000 <laughs> on one deal. But, <laughs> oh, gosh. But guys, I'm still out there in the trenches, still doing it, still working it. My son and I, and Noah and I, who is 11 years old, he and I spent all Sunday afternoon out riding around looking at houses. We went to three different towns and, you know, we're just, you know, I want to kind of teach him what we're doing and how we're doing it. So we rode around and looked at houses and, you know, but the mistakes that I've made, I've made so many different mistakes. One time I sent the contractor to the wrong house and they couldn't get in the house. So they broke in and started ripping the cabinets out of the kitchen. <laughs> oh, God. I couldn't believe that. So I still luckily, it was also a vacant foreclosed house. So it wasn't that big a deal. But we did fess up to it and, you know, and took care of the damage. Um, you know, I've broken in the wrong. I mean, I've inspected the wrong <laughs> property when I was out looking at properties. So I've just done a lot of different things. How about buying half the house? Buying, I bought a half a house one time. <laughs> oh my gosh, I'd forgotten about that. Yeah, we uh, that was a deal that we actually bought the note on. We bought the note and then had to foreclose on it. But come to find out, the legal description the the house was sitting on four parcels and the legal description only encumbered two of them. I had to go to uh, the other heirs of the property because the owners were deceased. I had to go to the different heirs of the property and get them to sign a deed and pay them money to give me the deed to a half a house because I really only <laughs> owned a carport and a kitchen. You know, I didn't own any bedrooms or bathrooms. <laughs> so, so I, and one of those people was in prison in California. <laughs> You know, so I'm sure his $500 would buy him a lot of smokes. <laughs> so, exactly. But, but anyway, I was able to get it worked out. So I, I wanted Paul to come on here first because Paul is our relational technologist and, and he sets up all of our automation, all of our uh, spreadsheets, our, you know, making our offers. He's the one that came up with a lot of the ideas or actually the ideas for the bid blaster and how that should work. And, um, and Todd, who was behind the scenes, he actually programmed it. Uh, uh, he wrote the whole program. But uh, but I wanted to bring Paul up here to talk to us a little bit about 
some of the challenges and mistakes that technology can bring into your business because there's so many people out there talking about automate this, automate that, mm -hmm. you know, push button this, easy button, done for you, that sort of thing. Let me tell you something, guys. If real estate was easy, everybody would be doing it. You know, mm -hmm. it's not it's not like that. You're and and I will tell you this, this is a Larry Goins guarantee. If you do enough deals, you will lose money on a deal. That is a Larry Goins guarantee. If you do enough deals, you will lose money on a deal eventually. One of the things I've learned as far as mistakes, you make your best deals when you have no money. When you start getting some money, you get a little bit um, overconfident and you you may buy too much, you know, or 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 spend too much money on a property. It's like my father-in-law, Andy Lakin says, real estate is like ice cream. You can get too much of it and you get sick. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and that's true. So, uh, Paul, tell us a little bit about, uh, about some of the ways that we, not only we use technology, but some of the mistakes that happen. No problem. Well, I'll tell you, one of the things that, um, you know, I'm the relational technologist here, but really what I am as a systems analyst is really what it boils down to. I take and I take a look at what we do systems wise and I try to make systems work with technology and help keep us making from mistakes. Um, you know, so much of the time I find we just get so busy, we'll get a property under contract and then we gotta go do the due diligence, but then we'll forget, oh, did we send a contractor out to go look at this property or not? Do we have a checklist in place? Do we have simple little stuff in place? Because when you start getting into a deal, you get the excitement going, you get the adrenaline going, we gotta put that to the side and actually just go, okay, step by step, step by step. It's methodical. So some of the things that for me that help keep me intact is making sure that I've got some kind of a checklist when I do this stuff. Uh, little applications like Wonderlist. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen that one. It's a great little application you can have on your uh, cell phone. Would you spell that for them because it's a little different than okay. you think? Yeah, it is. It's actually a German company that does it. Uh, Wunderlist, if you actually want to say it in the German way. Um, W-N-D-E-R-L-I-S-T. It's a great little application that you can have on your phone to where as you're walking through a house, you can set yourself up little check reminders, checklists, that kind of thing. Uh, you can actually share with other people the checklist to it. So stuff like that. Or you know, having an Evernote account where you have just a basic uh, setup to where when I go to a property, I get a property under contract, you know, these are the things I've got to do. I've got to go ahead and start setting up the closing. I've got to get the inspection going. Whatever it is that uh, the type of deal that you're doing, because some properties don't need an inspection, some you do. Uh, so you just kind of need to think it out. Think out the process from start to finish. Make sure you have a list and make sure you have a system in place to keep that list going to where you can just pull from it when you get that property and not one run on um, adrenaline. That's really good. That's really good. And guys, that's Wonderlist. You should check it out. W-U-N-D-E-R list.com. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it's great. I'm, I'm very big on checklists. I mean, listen, anybody, and I mean anybody can do real estate if you have a checklist, you know, exactly. you know, analyze the property. Does it meet this criteria? You know, exactly. call up the realtor, you know, get the pictures, you know, run the comps. Go to this website, run the comps. Go to that website, run the comps. Run the rent comps mm -hmm. on this website, that website, like rent range and rent o meter. Pull your comps on Zillow. Pull your mm -hmm. comps on RealQuest. Look at the crime on Trulia and uh, CrimeReports.com. You know, anybody can have a checklist and go through, and then you take your ARV times 0.7 minus repairs, minus closing costs, minus what you want to do. Boom, there's what you can pay for it then you know how much you can sell it for, right? Exactly, and it's one of those that you can automate as much as you want, but unless you actually have your system in place from start to finish, and you work that system, right? not just have it there, but that you start to work it, that you ask the questions, that you go out there and start doing the due diligence. When you start, even from the first moment that you call on the very first property, or make the very first offer, that you're making sure that you're getting every bit of info that you need to be able to make this deal work. That's awesome, that is really good. And you know, we could probably sit here all day and talk about mistakes we've made. I mean, just to give you a few more uh, that, that I have personally experienced is when you're doing deals in your retirement account, make sure you leave enough money in there and you don't spend all the money in your retirement account because what if you're doing a fix and flip in your retirement account? Now, you shouldn't do many of those because you don't want to be a dealer or you're going to pay mm -hmm. unit. Uh, but 
If you're doing a fix and flip in your retirement account, don't get all the way down to the wire where you have no money left in your retirement account. And the reason is, is you can't put personal money into that property or you can't go out there and save money by installing the kitchen yourself or putting down the carpet yourself. So you got to make sure you have a cushion in your retirement account. Now you can borrow the money as long as it's what's called non-recourse financing. But then even if you're down to zero, you got to go out and find somebody that's going to loan you the money with no recourse and you might only need a couple thousand dollars. Okay. And it's just going to be a pain to do. Um, one of the other things that, that I want to share with you that, that I have made the mistake over the years from time to time is, not being as involved in the business as I should have been. And and Paul is great, Randolph's great, Juanita, the guys, Wendy, that they are all awesome. But you know, I realized whenever I would back off and I'm not as involved as I could have been, I don't really know what's going on. I mean, yeah, it's great. We, hey, we had another closing. We deposited 18,000, we deposited 8,000, we deposited 15,000. But there again, I personally maybe missed out on a deal that maybe we, we don't want to do it over here, but maybe I could do it in my retirement account, mm -hmm. you know, or something like that. Or maybe we could sell it this way or that way, or as opposed to letting deals go and lose deposits on them, maybe there's a different way we could figure out how to operate it or whatever. I remember not too long ago, we had a property that we had bought for a hedge fund. And during the middle of it, the hedge fund pulled out. Well, here we are, we're in this property too deep. We're in this property for about fifty thousand mm -hmm. dollars, and um, and we put it on the MLS. Uh, but the problem is, we put it on the MLS for what uh, sixty nine, seventy nine, something, 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 something like, like that. that. We kept yeah. dropping it, kept dropping. We got people wanted it, but the problem is, is it had some old, old foundation problems. Now the house is only twenty some years old, but maybe thirty some years old. But um, it had some old foundation problems, but any buyer who's going to buy that property retail, the problem is, is they had to get an inspector. Mm -hmm. Okay. They had to get an inspection done and the inspection came back with the foundation problems. So I drove out there and looked at, I could have sent somebody, but I drove out there and looked at, and I said, okay, here's what we're going to do. We can't even sell this property for 50,000 cash. Right. We tried. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to raise the price. We raised it to 89.9. We sold it to somebody with fifteen thousand dollars down and seller finance it. Okay, mm -hmm. eighty nine nine. So now we have a seventy five thousand dollar note. Okay, I took that note and sold it for sixty thousand dollars. I made more money on it by seller financing it and selling the note and getting out of the deal right. than if I would have sold it for fifty thousand dollars cash. So. You've got to have more tools in your tool belt to know how to put a deal together. That's the very, very important thing that I want you to be aware of. Uh, do you have anything else you'd like to share about yeah. some mistakes? Yeah, actually, I was just thinking about, uh, you know, there's a mobile home that we actually did a while back ago that caught fire. I don't know if you remember that one. Um, and yeah, I do. We actually almost lost the insurance on it because come to find out, <clears throat> we just got into a routine. We're working with this one insurance company and they just have this web form that you fill out and it just adds us in and out of our, um, uh, account and they made a policy change that we didn't know about to where they were no longer uh, doing uh, modular mobile homes for their insurance. Right. And it was interesting because they first came <clears> back <throat> and were like, how did you even get this through our system? All that kind of stuff. But they had made a mistake of actually putting the insurance on so they went ahead and did it. But sometimes what just starts happening is you just start getting into a routine of doing stuff that you don't actually pay attention to the emails that come in or that kind of thing and just knows, hey, one little change. You know, luckily for us, they did go ahead and cover it. We actually got paid for the fire damage. Then we actually went ahead and sold a lot. And we actually made a good profit on the property. We did. But that was after about three months worth of negotiating back and forth. And, and here's the thing that sealed the deal on that. I remember this deal well. Mm -hmm. Here's the thing that sealed the deal. They made us an offer of this. We were claiming this, okay? So the thing that sealed the deal was they said, hey, look, we weren't even supposed to be insuring all these properties anyway. Exactly. So I went back and I said, okay, we could do one of two things. Either you can pay us what the claim is, or you can go back and reimburse us for all the insurance that you weren't supposed to collect the premiums on in the first place. And that was after over several years. And they realized they were much better off just paying us the claims. So, exactly. So that worked out. So uh, that's a, a couple of things that you can, uh, 
that you can use as far as mistakes. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a quick break and I'll be back with Wendy Sweet from Sweet Carolina Houses and Carolina Hard Money. We'll be right back. Larry Goins is coming to Houston, Texas for our next three-day training event. It is three days of intense training with Larry and our team of professional investors. Learn the same strategies we use in our investment business every single day over the course of three days in Houston. The industry is constantly changing, but Larry has your back with the latest on the markets and what you need to do to take advantage of it. The three-day training event is it's free for all owners of Larry's real estate courses, including the ultimate buying and selling machine, filthy riches, real estate day trading jumpstart, and the bid blaster. Find out more by calling 803-831-2858 or by visiting LarryGoinsLive.com. Once again, not a student, not a problem. Just get on the phone. Call one of our business advisors today, 803-831-2858, and ask them how you can attend our upcoming three-day training event. Hello and welcome back to Invest in Yourself. This is season one, episode five. And I'm here with the legend, the myth, <laughs> live and in person, Wendy Sweet. What's up? Woohoo! Everything's up. How you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm awesome. doing good. Awesome. So I see some of your some of your crew back there. Alex, come on up here. Huh? Come, come on here. up here. Come on up here. Quick, quick, quick. I only have a little Roll bit. Roll up here. <laughs> Guys, this is Alex. This is Wendy's son. He is the hunter man, the survivalist. He's already shot his first deer, right? Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Caught Did a three and a half and foot hammerhead. Got three and a half foot hammerhead shark, too. A couple of weeks ago, right? Uh, a couple of days ago. A couple of days ago? Yeah. That's huge. He loves to fish, loves to hunt. He is awesome. Listen, let me tell you something. If everything goes to the wayside and you have to be a prepper or whatever, I'm calling this guy right here. He's gonna right. he's gonna keep us alive. That's right. <laughs> That's right. right. He can. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> he's gonna save his mom and his daddy. That's right. <laughs> That's awesome. Cool. Wait, hey to everybody. Hey. Say what's up. All right, we're done. Go on. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh, that's cool. You feel like a star. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. So, uh, Wendy, what are we? What kind of mistakes are we going to talk about? I mean, I know you oh, had to, had to make some up because you've never made oh, any. Oh no, no, no. In fact, one of the things that I tell people when uh, they call us for hard money loans, I always <clears throat> um, ask them to to. Uh, follow my lead, learn from my mistakes because there's lots of poop out there and I've stepped in every single pile. Uh, so I want other people, <laughs> nice you know, save, save your <laughs> shoes and just use mine. So th there's so many mistakes that you can make That's in true. investing and, um, and we want to avoid as many as we possibly can. But what I really want to do is I know we have a short amount of time. I want to touch on like the four top mistakes that I see a lot of people make especially if they're doing hard money lending, because if you make a mistake and you're paying some big bucks on hard money um, or any type of private money, if you're paying interest on any kind of a loan, it's going to cost you that much more when you make a mistake. You're That's having true. to make more payments. That's so uh, my number one thing is cutting corners. Um, as an invest, uh, as an, uh, a lender, I get the dear pleasure of being able to go in and inspect all the properties and make sure that the work is not only being done, but being done in a quality like manner. And one of the things that always stands out to me um, is the corners that people cut. And what I mean by that is uh, putting baseboard up that doesn't really match or instead of, of changing out the hardware on doors, using the old gold worn hardware knobs and hinges, the hinges are painted over, they don't spend the hundred bucks it right. would cost to replace all of them into to nickel. Um, covering over rot, uh, you replace a floor on top of a subfloor that's kind of spongy. It might, you could replace yeah. it, you might avoid placing it, replacing it. 
it, it, you're saving yourself, you know, $100 or less by not replacing something like that. And, and the, the worst thing about it is people, uh, I've got one real recent actually that this guy bought a duplex and he took this duplex knowing that he was going to turn it into condos, went to the city, got it pre-approved to turn it into selling it as individual con condo units or a townhouse unit and did everything he needed to do except the one thing that really needed to be done, which was separate the meters. <laughs> so he's going to sell the house now, it gets inspected, and now he's got to spend another $3,000 in separating the meters, knowing that he would have to go in there but it to do that. Closing. It did. It delayed his closing, pushed it over his two-point renewal fee, so it's cost him a lot more than $3,000 to, to do something that he should have done in the beginning anyway. Very good point. Very good point. You know, the other thing that people do, my number two uh, a pet peeve, I would call it, is underestimating your repairs uh, you know we all want to spend as little as possible when we're going into a property to rehab that's exactly right <laughs> and, and we're tight and that's, <laughs> <laughs> i squeak when i want I, and and you know i want to make sure that i get the best deal out there that i can you know i go to lowe's and buy all the clearance stuff my garage is full of sinks and countertops and light fixtures and all kinds of stuff. So I try to get uh, yeah, that too. <laughs> that too. Check out one near you. That's right. <laughs> it, it, it is a great spot. Tile. I get a lot of tile from there. So I'm always trying to save money. But the, the one thing that I see a lot of people do is underestimate what it would really cost to fix up a house. And, and sometimes I even do that. In fact, I'm not very um, I do it very, very well estimating houses when I'm looking at other people's houses. But if I'm going to rehab the house, I think I can do it a lot cheaper. That's a husband as a contractor. Well, that helps. <laughs> and you're like, oh, Gene can do this. Gene can do right. that. Gene can do That's this. Right. That's exactly right. But the thing is, it really, you really look and need to look at what it would cost for somebody else to do it. Whether you're going to do it yourself, which is a mistake, or you get your husband to do it, which then also it's also a mistake. <laughs> or, Easy <now. laughs> yeah, but what you really need to estimate what it's going to cost in, in I would say midway. You don't want to give it the highest cost. You don't want to give it the lowest cost. Estimate what it's really going to cost and borrow the money to cover it. Don't think you're going to put all this stuff on credit cards because I'm telling you, you'll run out of money quick because you know other things will pop up. Oh, yeah. So underestimating is a really, really big problem that I see. My other number three would be over improving a house. I see so many people going in and buying these houses that are first time home buyer type houses, bread and butter that we love to fix up and they're putting granite on a countertop. Yes, granite is beautiful, but my goodness, you don't need granite to be able to rehab the house. To, you don't have to put granite in it to sell it quickly. Yes, it would. It always makes a difference. Everybody loves granite, but you could get some really nice laminate countertops that would make all the difference in the world. If you want to improve it for the price of the neighborhood. Absolutely, absolutely. We were driving, um, in fact, Paul and I were driving down the road looking at a house that Paul just recently bought. In fact, he closes on it Friday. Awesome. And we're driving down the road and there, there are these three bedroom, two bath, bread and butter houses all up and down the street. And we passed this one house in particular and it happened to be on that home and garden TV show where Ty goes in and fixes up the house and you know sends the family out and they move that bus. You know that show yeah, I'm yeah, talking yeah. about? Well, this house was like, four times the size of all the other houses in the neighborhood. Uh, uh, and it was beautiful, but I'm thinking, gosh, they'll never be they'll able never to sell. they'll never be able to sell it. Not for what it would really be worth. Right. Um, now this house that we're looking at too, um, in this particular neighborhood, it is a three bedroom, two bath, uh, bread and butter kind of house. But this house is all this whole neighborhood is just now getting ready to turn. So yes, this is a neighborhood that we do want to put countertops on right. and we do want to make sure that we've got um, nice tile in the bathroom. Uh, we want to make sure that it's not a one bath house. Right. We, we want to just go that extra step and put a, a better grade of flooring in, not just your regular laminate hardwood floors. We want to make sure we take that extra step in this neighborhood because it's just in that time frame where it's flipping and people are really starting to, 
to move into that neighborhood. So you, you've got to be in touch with the neighborhood. You don't want to um, over improve. You're going to be throwing money truly down a pit. And, and one thing that really helps too is talk to several realtors who focus in that market. If you if you can talk to a couple of realtors that already have listings in the neighborhood, mm -hmm. and have them you know tell you you know well, you know should should I put granite in this house? You know should I take out the wall between here? Should I open it up? Should I add a deck on the back? Should I spend extra money on landscaping? What should you do for the neighborhood? A realtor who's already successful in the neighborhood and has several listings or has already sold several properties. Wouldn't you agree? That's exactly right. In fact, uh, what what I like to do when I'm looking at a house like that is I see who else has these houses, whether they're listed or whether they're just listed and sold. You want to go in the houses. That's true. Now, as as a realtor, I'm able to pull up on MLS. I'm able to see the interior pictures of what's going on in the neighborhood, and I can see what other people have done. So I really know what my competition is. Right. But if you're not a realtor and you don't have the luxury of being able to go in houses very very easily, um, you need to call the realtors that have these houses listed. They're happy to show you the houses. They don't need to know that you're not going to buy them, <laughs> but they're happy to show you the houses there. They can also just send you the listing on from MLS that'll have all the interior pictures, which will help a lot. Exactly. Plus you can talk to them about the possibility of listing your house. So really, I mean, they want to send you everything mm -hmm. that's out there. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, my fourth and final, well, I shouldn't call it my final. There's a lot of things that There's people time. make mistakes in and we only have time for me to cover four. <laughs> That's Today. several more shows. <laughs> but the, the fourth one would be under improving a house. Um, and I can give you a great example. I just inspected a house for uh, a client who who is in, it's a $250 price range. In this area, $250,000 is a really nice house. Pretty nice it's house. a nice house. It's a good neighborhood. And, and um, this is a granite countertop kind of house. Uh, this, this house also is a wood floor kind of house. This borrower usually does really, really good work. But for some reason in this house, he underestimated his budget, what he thought he was going to do. And he cut corners just a little bit, but he cut corners by putting a lower grade of everything in the house. That's where he made his mistake. I opened up the front door and the first thing that knocks me down is these hardwood floors are a very low grade laminate hardwood. You know, you, you hear it sounds like plastic when you touch it with it your fingernails. Good. Yeah. And I, I was really disappointed in that because just a couple of grades higher, which wouldn't have cost that much more for him, just a couple of grades higher in the same type of flooring, it would have looked a hundred times better. He, he already had granite countertops there. And what he did do is put a, just a jamming backsplash, a really nice glass backsplash to match the countertops. So that looks so terrific. Glass tiles yeah, there. absolutely. That looks terrific. And I'm happy with the kitchen. Um, then I walk into the bathrooms and, he, and the linoleum is down on the floors as opposed to ceramic. Exactly. And it's it's nice linoleum, but it's not the kind of linoleum I would want in my house. A $250,000 house. That's exactly right. And it's the same floor in every house. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. However, if you're going to use cheap linoleum, you don't want to put the cheap linoleum in every single bathroom. <laughs> and there were five bathrooms in that house. Wow. Five bedrooms, five baths. It wow. was a huge house. Lots of stuff going on. So that the other thing too, on the outside of the house, he went to um, add some things to the landscaping, uh, planted some uh, small flowers and mulched it. Uh, it really, really looked nice. Mm -hmm. The flowers that he chose were the little tiny ones that you get six in a six pack yeah. that are going to be dead in a week. Nobody's going to be Plus there. Plus you can't really see them from the exactly. road anyway. Exactly. If he had gone ahead and gotten the ones that are in the little half um, half, gallon. half gallon container that are a little bit more healthy, it would have truly made a difference in how that house looked. Yeah. So the and, and he's one that left all the doorknobs gold and painted over. 
when, you know, for him, it would have cost him $188 because I actually talked with him afterwards and he priced it. It was $188 to replace the doorknobs and the hinges in that house. So those little tiny things make all the difference in the world. Now, will somebody not buy that house? I don't think that's going to be the case. It's going to sell, but would somebody buy it in a week or is it going to take him now two to three months to sell? And what did he say? He's paying me hard money payments every month. He's not saving any money by not fixing the house up like he should have. Guys, you got to think about this, okay? Not only is under improving, it, it, it hurts the house in being able to sell, but think about it. If this guy owes $200,000 on this house, okay? Say he's paying 15% interest. That's 30 grand a year. Mm -hmm. That's 2,500 a month. That's just under $100 a day, okay? Think, think about that really. If it takes him an extra two months to sell that property because they go in, ooh, look at the doorknobs, look at the vinyl mm -hmm. over here, look at this, look at that. You know, it takes him an extra two months to get a buyer that's okay with all that. He just spent another $5,000 right. in interest payments for that. So it's not only about saving money, it's what's gonna help your house sell quicker so you can get in and out of it. Because the key is turning the money. Buy, sell, buy, sell, buy, right. sell. Not buy, sit on it for eight months and then sell. It's buy, sell, buy, sell. So you need to turn your money. The more times you can turn your money per year, the more money you're going to make. Right. So not only does under improving hurt being able to sell it, but it's gonna be on the market that much longer. And you can get a premium price too. Very well could be by, by doing it the right way, mm -hmm. They could get more money for it by spending more money. That's on right. The property. That's exactly right. Now I do appreciate the interest income. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I'm always happy for that. But I really want him to be successful in what he does. That's right. He so he'll come, come back, back again and again. That's and again. right. That's exactly yeah. right. And you have people that do big, huge three, four, five, six hundred thousand dollar yes. projects yes. or more, and they still come back to you. Yes, they do. You know, because hey, they're using OPM, mm -hmm. other people's money. Leveraging what they have. So uh Wendy, thank you so much. Thank I really you. appreciate that. That's thank awesome. You. So we're gonna take a quick break and we'll be right back with the man, the legend, and the myth himself, Dean West, our senior business advisor. Stay tuned. <laughs> Simply the best real estate mentoring by mentors that actually invest in real estate every single day. Join Larry's Inner Circle today and work with us to jumpstart your real estate career or to expand your real estate empire. Come on out to Lake Wiley and work with us in our office, the same place we're doing our live broadcast today. We do it live from Larry's Inner Circle. Or you can work with Randolph and Paul directly over the phone. We'll even send Randolph to your house or office to work directly with you and your team. To find out more and get your free 30-minute investor strategy session with one of our business advisors, you can do so by calling 803-831-2858 or by visiting larrysinnercircle.com. Once again, that's 803-831-2858 or Larry's Inner .com. It's simply the best real estate mentoring program in the world. Hello and welcome back to Invest in Yourself, live from Lake Wiley, South Carolina, right across the state line from Charlotte, North Carolina. If you're ever in down this way, be sure and stop by and see us and say, hey. Right? <laughs> Guys, I got Dean West with me. Dean is our senior business advisor. He's been with us for years and years. He's been longer than anybody, really, yep. except for Melanie. Yep. Melanie's been here the longest, and you're next, right? I think so, yeah. That's I'm senior awesome. business advisor, either for my longevity here or my age, one or the other. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's funny, Dean? Every time I go somewhere and speak, I mean, literally every single time, you know, that people come up to me and say, hey, how's Dean? Tell, tell Dean I said hi. Dean, I talk to Dean every couple of weeks, and, and he follows up with me and helps me get going, gives me suggestions and ideas, and, and keeps me motivated, keeps me going on. So, you know, I, I really just appreciate it. And, in fact, you remember last week, 
I brought you a picture of a guy. The guy said, you know, be sure and tell Dean. I said, I'm going to take a picture of you. You know, you remember that? <laughs> that turned out to be Jim Kaiser. Yeah, yeah I'm yeah. Wisconsin. Yeah. yeah. That's a good friend. Good that's friend. good. That's good. That's really cool. That's really cool. So, um, you know, Dean talks to our students every day, all day long. He's probably on the phone, I don't know, three to six hours a day, something like that. And uh, he's talking to students every day, all day, from all over the country, even around the world. And uh, it, is, it is true. I mean, you're on the phone all the time. And uh, so I just want to ask you, Dean, what do you think is probably the number one question or challenge? You know, because that kind of has to do with mistakes because people don't want to make mistakes. They're afraid. You know, they have that fear of getting started. What do you feel like is probably the number one question or challenge that you've gotten from students? A common question with both courses, because uh, each course has their own set of courses. Uh, it would probably be, how do I get realtors to work with me, Larry? How do I get realtors to work with me? Wow, that's a good one. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's really not that hard. Uh, basically, when you're going to speak with a realtor anyway, it's about a property that you're interested in. So right. naturally, using your scripts that you have, uh, you're going to ask all the right questions, uh, but from there, just kind of, you know, strike up a general conversation with them. Uh, ask them, ask them uh, if they worked with investors before. Are they investor friendly? How long they've been with realtors, and uh, and then to me, uh, just tell them what you do, what what your model that you're working uh, business wise is, and uh, you know, let them. Uh, Ask them the question that, uh, based on the information that you provided for them, uh, and you've been an investor, that you're not going to be making offers at list price. Right. But are they willing to work with you? That's right. And most of them will. Uh, always give them an opportunity to prove themselves. But uh, you know, if they say no, perhaps always ask for you know, are they someone else there that I might work with? That's right. Uh, in their office. Yes, in their office, and uh, usually. Uh, you know, not every realtor uh, has the time. Uh, you know, some are really, really busy, but uh, give them an opportunity to prove themselves. But uh, if they don't work with you in the fashion that you think that they should be, uh, next is a, is a very popular word in real estate. Next? Next. <laughs> next? You know, and, and just to kind of expand on that a little bit, I know there's a lot of people out there that are, that are brand new. You haven't done your first deal yet. And that's that's another reason that when people come here to our inner circle, we get you on the phone. You're on the phone hammering out deals. You're making offers. You're negotiating with realtors. And 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 I don't let you use a script in my office. I have a list of questions you can ask, but but I don't let you use a script. And the reason is, is if you can do it in my office around other peers, another eight or ten people that are doing the same thing without a script. Surely, when you get home, you can do it with the script. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. You know, it, it kind of forces you to do it. And I've had people sit right here in that office, this office, you know, just crying because I can really do this. I really can do this. And and, and that's one of the things that we teach you how to do. But, but don't be afraid to let the realtor know you're brand new. In fact, I tell people, it's okay to say, look, if you might ask the realtor a question like, uh, like you know, well, how much work is it going to take to fix it up? And sometimes you'll get a realtor that might say something like, well, you're the investor, you tell me. Yeah. I mean, that's not uncommon. I've had them say that to me. Sure. So, you know, you might say something like, well, you know, yes, I am an investor, but I'm brand new at this. I've got some education. I got my money lined up. I'm ready, get, ready to get started. And, and I'm ready, willing, and able to buy a property. All I'm really looking for is a realtor that can work with me and help me get started. I may not know the exact questions to ask or the right questions to ask. Will you help me? I mean, you're really just, you're putting yourself out there, making yourself vulnerable. And sometimes you're going to get them to say, well, you need to work with somebody that's used to working with investors or has the time. I don't have time to train you or whatever, Absolutely. you know, but, but that's okay. Like Dean said, next, next, next. That's right. And, and don't worry about telling the truth. Hey, I'm brand new. Absolutely. Help me out. Help me out here. You know, we've even called up listing agents on properties before and want to make an offer. And they say, you know, I'm sorry, oh, I, I don't deal with buyers. I only deal with, with the banks and the asset managers. 
you know? So I got a way to handle that too. You know, I say, uh, well, well, let me see if I understand this correctly. You know, I'm calling you about the property. You have it listed. You probably know more about the property than anybody else, whether in your office or anywhere, because you listed the property, but you want me to go out and find another, another agent that can be my buyer's agent so they can send the offer to you so you can give them half the commission. Is that what I'm hearing? Am I understanding that correctly? Exactly. You know? <laughs> so, you know, and, and even still, if they say, well, yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. Here's my next line. Well, who's the best agent in your office? <laughs> they can't say it's me, right? Right. Because <laughs> they just told me I can't work with them or they don't want to work with me. You know? So, so I, I love to get the response you know, to that one. <laughs> but that's the way it is. So, um, Dean, I know you talk to a lot of people and there's a lot of people out there that are uh, that are scared. They have fear of getting started. You know, tell us about some of the good things that you, you know, I mean, I know you talk to students and, and you have people call you on a regular basis to to share their successes with you because i know you forward those emails to me you know every week so i like so, you to yeah uh, share and every rewards as well Larry. exactly and i appreciate that i have a i have a person that uh, comes to mind i this accomplishes a lot of different things what i'm fixing to uh to make mention of but uh, i'm going to use terrell um a guy from minnesota uh, bought the Filthy Riches program from us, okay. uh, but didn't quite have the money to do any funding. Right. Now this guy, he's he's independent, right? Uh, didn't want to use you for funding. Wanted to do everything on his own. Sure. Uh, had about fifteen hundred dollars to invest. Well, guess what he invested in? A hot dog stand. No kidding. Invested in a hot dog stand. Wow. Showed up and now he had a normal job. Um, driving a school bus, as a matter of fact. Uh -huh. uh, but he took this hot dog cart and he went out to Walmarts and other areas and he sold hot dogs in his time off. Wow. Took him about eight months, but he called me. He said, all right, Dean, I'm ready to start making some offers. Um, I've got to, I've got $10,000. I've made selling hot dogs. Selling hot dogs, uh, 10 grand. Absolutely. That's huge. He said, where's a good place to invest? And I gave him a lot of market areas, uh, but he chose uh, Dayton, Ohio. Okay. Uh, sent in three offers, the first three offers that he's ever made. Wow. Got one accepted. 33% success rate. Yes. <laughs> uh, but uh, he wound up, he paid uh, 7000 uh, approximately 7100 for the property. Uh -huh. uh, put it on eBay, just like you tell people in your program, uh -huh. and uh, sold it through owner financing. Wow. Is in the sixth month of season in, uh, right now. Right. Call me the other day, he's going to uh, uh, sell the note and he's coming to the inner circle. That's awesome. Yes, he let me know that. That's well. awesome. That's uh, but great. his persistence uh, paid off. I mean, he's, he's, a, he's an entrepreneur. Uh, he has the spirit. Uh, he worked toward his goal uh, of making enough money to fund his own deal. He got there, uh, made the offers, got the success. From, get an offer accepted and now is doing deals is soon sent a great testimonial by the way uh, that's which awesome. i shared with you uh, yeah, so awesome. it's, it's a long no it's about five about five good minutes there well that's uh, good but uh, he is so tickled and uh, yes he's definitely coming to the inner circle as well that is awesome that's really good guys i guess the key here is just make sure that you take action you do it this guy went out and got a hot dog cart and set up at Walmart and other places and, and ended up doing do, selling enough hot dogs to go out and buy property. The other thing that I want you to, to think about was Dean said that the guy lived in Minnesota and he did a deal in Dayton, Ohio. Absolutely. You know, he did. which is nowhere close to each other. Now I'm geographically challenged, but it's nowhere close to each other. <laughs> no, it's a few <laughs> states away. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that's good. Well, that's awesome, Dean. And, and I really appreciate you taking the time to come in here and share that with us. Not only, you know, the, some of the biggest challenges that people make or have, but also the success stories. Because I know you get them every week because you said them to me. Yeah, that, that is true. But the, the whole key thing here, Larry, is knowing what you want to do and taking the action to make it happen for you. That's good. If you, if you, if you want it bad enough, nothing's going to stand in your way. And Terrell wanted it bad enough. That's awesome. That's really good. 
And hey, if you want to talk to Dean or any of our other business advisors, just give our office a call. 803-831-2858. Yes. 2858. <laughs> 803-831-2858. Dean, thanks all, man. I really appreciate it. Here's to your success. There you go. Thanks Thank you, Larry. Larry Goins is coming to Houston, Texas for our next three-day training event. It is three days of intense training with Larry and our team of professional investors. Learn the same strategies we use in our investment business every single day. The industry is constantly changing, but Larry has your back with the latest on the markets and what you need to do to take advantage of it. This three-day training event is free for all owners of Larry's Real Estate Courses, including the Ultimate Buying and Selling Machine, Filthy Riches, Real Estate Day Trading Jumpstart, and The Bid Blaster. Find out more now by calling 803-831-2858 or by visiting LarryGoinsLive.com. And remember, this is the only time this year we're traveling west of the Mississippi. So if you're west of the Mississippi, you need to make it to Houston, Texas for our event. Once again, it's 803-831-2858 or LarryGoinsLive.com. And if you're not a student, it's not a problem. Call one of our business advisors today at 803-831-2858 and just ask them how you can attend our upcoming three-day training event in Houston, Texas. And live from New York, it's Saturday night. <laughs> That's why I keep waiting to hear. <laughs> do you do that for Saturday Night Live? You're really good at it. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> All right, so now we have Nathan from our office. Nathan, Nathan is is uh, works with all of our business advisors in the office here. We used to call them course consultants, but they're really so much more than course consultants. They're really business advisors. And Nathan Amaral is also a speaker, a trainer, a coach. He works with people with uh, uh, with their uh, internet marketing business and motivation and sales and all that good stuff. So I wanted to bring Nathan up here uh, to share a little bit about some of the things of not to do or mistakes that you don't want to make. So Nathan, what do you have planned for us today? So today, you know, uh, Larry, we're talking about conversations and mistakes investors make in conversations. And over the years, I've lost count of how many seminars I've been to, lost count of how many people I've networked with, whether it's RIA groups or live seminars. And you know, over the years, I found that there's some mistakes that people always make. Investors, just like yourself, that are making on a regular basis that you gotta stop doing. So I wanted to give you three things that you need to stop doing, but I also wanted to give you three things that you need to be doing. So the first one is to shut up. You talk too much. <laughs> the reality is a lot of people kind of just spew out, throw off everything that they're doing, everything that they're working on, um, what type of what type of real estate they do. But the reality is the best thing to do is ask more questions. And a lot of people are not asking enough questions. If you know more about the person that you're talking to, you'll be you know if they're going to be a potential partner for you or something that you can partner up on. So. Just real quick, uh, yeah. you have two ears and one mouth for a reason. Absolutely. <laughs> and you know, the, uh, the best way, uh, the illustration I like to use is basketball. I think basketball is a perfect example because, you know, one, you can't hold the ball for too long because then you get some foul, and I don't even know what the name of the foul is, but um, I think it's is it dribbling or something. I don't even know. But <laughs> I don't know. I didn't have a basketball bat when I was growing up. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's the reality of it. I look at conversations like basketball. You get the ball, that's the question. You dribble it once, that's your response, and then you throw it back with another question, right? That's how long you should actually hold, uh, be, be uh, holding the ball just for a short period of time and getting another question back out. If you hold the ball and hog the ball, right? They call it a ball hog. And you don't want to be doing that because then no one really wants you on their team after that. Then you could start getting called names. Is that the official term? For I, I don't think it is, but ball I just made it up. Ball right hog right here. Flag on Flag the ball. <laughs> That's what I call it. <laughs> Can you tell how much we know about football? <laughs> I know nothing of the sport, actually. I just know that it's a true reality because when I used to play basketball, people used to be like, you can't do that. You can't do that. And 
And that's the same thing with conversations um, that investors make. And, and one thing, you have to keep that basketball analogy in your mind. So when you get asked a question, answer it quickly, dribble that ball, and then pass it right back with another question. Uh, the, the next thing is, and I know I've mentioned this before, is about getting business cards in your conversations. You know, instead of being one to pass out business cards, uh, be the one to collect the business cards. And if we did a small segment on that last time, so be sure to check back on the previous shows that we've done about business cards and communication because you should not be the one just passing out your business cards everywhere, collect the data, then follow up with that data. Right. Follow up with those people that, you, that you're building relationships with. So uh, that's really important. So many times uh, with so many events, people are so eager to pass out their business card. I've seen times and people, I've been at seminars where, and I hope this is not you, but you know, I've seen people at seminars where they're just placing business cards down on the table and during lunch break, and no one's even at the ta- at their at their seat, and just expecting like someone's going to pick up their car and they're like, oh, I'm going to do business with this for person. no reason. For no reason, yeah, just a waste of time and a waste of money. Uh, that's not the way to do it. So be sure not to do that. Uh, and thirdly, is be prepared. Um, most investors, when they're building <laughs> conversations, they're not prepared. They don't know what they're saying. They don't know how they're going to respond. They don't know the objections they're going to get. They don't even have their elevator pitch. A lot of investors don't even have their elevator pitch ready to go, knowing what to say. A lot of investors don't know what an elevator pitch is. Yeah. Share it with them. So an elevator pitch. (laughs) (laughs) Come on, tell us. Yeah, I'm going to tell you. An elevator pitch is a 30-second intro to what you do, but also how you can help your target audience, how you can help the person, your exact client that that you're going to do business with. The clearer you are with your elevator pitch, the more, uh, the better the client you're going to get. That way, that person can decipher whether, hey, I can do business with you, or I may know someone who can. So be sure to work on the elevator pitch. I know everyone talks about it, but you have to have it ready to go. And for example, like if I met, if I just met you for the first time, maybe yeah. I'm an investor. I'm looking for private money. Okay, that's my goal. So uh, I just met you. You know, hey, my name is Nathan. I'm an engineer. You know, well, what do you do? I help engineers are an eight to ten percent return secured by real estate. Exactly. That's a great point. You notice how Larry brought up the part engineers and it was geared towards me. It was geared towards the target audience. And that's what you want to do is make sure your elevator pitch and your communication is geared towards that person. So I'll tell you what, you know this Larry firsthand I'm sure the worst thing you can do is attract the wrong person into your business or into your life. That's right. And it's all by the words that you use. So your elevator pitch, make sure you have that down. Oh just real quick I yeah. want to share this. Uh, we have hired a lot of people over the years, whether it be in our education training business uh, as well as our real estate business. We started posting our core values and our mission statement in all of our recruiting ads, whether it be at uh, Munster or what's that other one we use? We use Not Craigslist, Craig. but um, there's another one. You know, indeed, indeed. Indeed.com. Yeah. Uh, wherever we post our ads, we put our core values and mission statement. And the people who work out the best are the ones that contact us and say, I'm responding to your ad because I'm looking for an organization like this that has these kind of values. And and that's exactly why those people responded to the ad. You know, everybody wants to make money, yes, but people want autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Okay, so please keep that in mind. Yeah, no, no, it's very true. Thanks for sharing. All right, so I want to give you three things uh, to do in your conversation. So things you need to start applying right away. The first one is to name drop, all right? You've probably heard this before. Maybe you've used it, maybe you haven't. But the important thing to do with name dropping is to mention people's names that you've done business with. That person may not know the person, or they do. They may know them, or they may not know them. It's okay. The important thing is it's called borrowed credibility, right? It is a marketing term. Borrowed credibility means you've done business with someone else in the industry um, in a related field that you can say, hey, I've worked with this person, this person, and that person, and they've been happy with your, their results. Just make sure it's someone that you've done good business with. <laughs> it's like you see a lot of people out there on the internet promoting products and services, and they have a picture of themselves with Trump or a picture of mm-hmm. themselves with this person or that person that's been on TV, you know. Absolutely. I mean, big deal, they probably paid to go to some event, and they got stood in line, and for three seconds, like, <laughs> You know, <laughs> you know, big deal, right? Yeah, right. You know, who cares? <laughs> yeah, that, and that's just like surface level credibility. But people right? eat that up. Yeah, they really do. Yeah, and it's the surface level credibility. It's like you know, okay, hey, I'm with this famous person. That's it works to a level. But what's even more powerful in your conversations is that when you say, "Hey, I've worked with 
Larry Goins and whoever it is for you. I work with this person and this is what they said. That goes into point number two that I want to share with you, something to do in your conversations. And that's um, share that reference, right? Share that success reference. Like, for example, if you worked with someone, you got them positive results, tell your prospect, your, uh, your convert, the person you're building a relationship with, to call that success story, to call that person you've done good business with. Share your references. When you do that, you're actually going to have someone else speak very highly of you. It's called edification. So let someone edify you about what you've done and the positive relationship they have with you. It's also known as, um, well, yeah, it's edification, but what, is, what does it say? You know, scripture says, uh, let another man praise you. And that is so powerful. It works very well in business. Um, so last one, number three, is follow up within the week. As soon as you get a business card, as soon as you meet someone, today there's a bunch of great technology out there that can automate the process of following up within the first week. You should follow up within the first day if you can, uh, within 24 hours of meeting that person. Like Larry always says, make sure, um, whether it's in an email or on a website, make sure your picture's there so they remember who you are because people remember more by face, facial recognition than they do always a name. So that's exactly right. That's why it's very important to have your picture on your business card, okay? Yeah. No matter what you look like, it's important to have your picture on your business card so they remember you. Now, all the stuff that Nathan mentioned, how are you going to put that into practical use? You know, going to a RIA group, networking with people, going to seminars and conferences and events and, you know, like going to LarryGoinsLive.com and signing up for our Houston event. You know, be sure and bring plenty of business cards. and. But, but meet people, don't just be throwing out business cards or putting them on the table or whatever, you know. But like when you're working with realtors or, or for sell by owners or anybody, you want to get inside the head of your prospect. If I'm calling a realtor about a house, okay, I see a house, I want to call the listing agent, I want to tell that realtor what they want to know to, to know that they're going to earn a commission. I might say something along the lines of during the conversation, I might say something like, you know, the realtors that we work with on a regular basis with and close a lot of deals with, they love us because we do what we say we're going to do and we close deals. Now, that doesn't mean anything. All I'm really doing is just telling them what I want them to hear about other realtors that I'm already working with. The realtors we work with on a regular basis love us because we do what we say we're going to do and we close deals, which is what you want, isn't it? I mean, really, absolutely, exactly, exactly, and 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 that's just one little simple way that you can use some of what Nathan is talking to you about. And I always, uh, I, I heard a guy say one time, "Camp out in the head of your prospect, whoever you're talking to, think from them. What do they want to hear? Okay, what do they? For example, when a realtor might a realtor might say to us, you know, well, in order for me to submit an offer, I need a proof of funds letter and a copy of your bank statement. I need you to sign this agreement." I use that as an opportunity to reel them in a little bit. I say, you know, that's not a problem. In fact, if you'd like, I'd be glad to send you a bank statement showing we could probably buy 30 or 40 of these houses at once. Would that be okay? I mean, at the same time, what I've done is say, I'm a big fish, okay? And you can do that too. You can go out and get a proof of funds letter. It doesn't have to be your money. You can go out and get a proof of funds letter for the same thing. You can say, it's okay. I could send you a proof of funds letter showing we can buy 30 or 40 of these houses. Would that be all right? You know, and you're really just reeling them in. They're thinking, hey, I got a live one on the line here, which is what you want them to think, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Unless, unless you're brand new and you're playing the role of, hey, I'm brand new. Just help me out. Help me get started. So, uh, Nathan, you have anything else that you want to share? No. Well, I, you know, Zig Ziglar, when you were mentioning about, um, when you're mentioning about you know camping out in your prospect's mind, Zig Ziglar says it best. When you focus on other people, when you focus on what they need and want in their life, you'll get what you want out of the deal. You'll get what you want out of the relationship. What's important is to keep your prospect, your relationship uh, top of mind because then that will just come right back to you. That's awesome. I got a couple more quick things that I do want to share. Uh, and, and I think we're going to open it up to some Q&A here in a few minutes. So if you have some questions, be sure and submit them. And, and Todd, um, <laughs> Mr. Announcer, <laughs> will be sure and, 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 uh, and uh, call out the questions here in just a few minutes. But a, a thing that I want to share with you, some of the mistakes that I have made as well, is not being up to date on the market and the economy. Okay? Not being up to date on the market and the economy. So um, 
I, I subscribe to a couple of really good daily newsletters. One is called DS News. Uh, you just go to dsnews.com. Another one is called Housing Wire, and Nathan gets that also. Don't yeah, you? I do. Yeah. yeah. So one of the things that came out in Housing Wire today, just today, was homes are officially being sold at the highest price ever. And they go on in their article. I'm just going to give it to you real quick. But up until 2006 in July, the highest median price home was $230,400. Now, according to the National Association of Realtors, the, uh, the highest median price homes or the, uh, the median existing home sales price is $236,000. $400, so $6,000 higher. But having said that, this is a national thing, okay? I want you to remember something. Real estate is local, okay? You go and you buy a house in Montgomery or Birmingham, Alabama, or Detroit, Michigan, you're not gonna have median prices of $236,000. I can tell you that right now, okay? So even in places in the Carolinas, it's gonna be, gonna be true as well. So just remember guys, real estate is local okay real estate is local so um i understand that we don't have any questions right now so um i i want to thank you guys for listening and watching today i really do appreciate it and uh thanks again we're gonna be coming to houston uh if you want more information on that call our office 803-831-2858 or go to larrygoinslive.com uh, <clears throat> if you want to see about working with my team and I personally, uh, with, with all my guys here, uh, go to larrysinnercircle.com. It'll tell you more about that as well. And uh, with that, I really do thank you for watching and go out there and invest in yourself. We'll see you next time. Thanks a lot. Yeah.